is, why it's important, and what kinds of knowledge, skills, beliefs it takes to promote a sense of self-determination, along with um, a few activities and strategies that we can use to help become more self-determined. One of the things I'd like to do now is take a look at how learning disabilities and ADHD may impact self-determination. And one of the things that I think is really important and, and will be stressed throughout everything that we're saying today is how individual each of us are. And so it will be different um, even though you may have ADHD, you may have a learning disability, um, may have a physical disability, um, we can go with some general guidelines or issues about how that may affect our self-determination, but again, we're each unique and so it will be different for each of us. I would <coughs> like to, well, I'm going to come back to those in a minute because I want to get straight to the ADHD. Um, as I mentioned, building on previous uh, sessions, last year Dr. Russell Barkley, one of the uh, most prominent um, researchers in the field of ADHD was here. And as I was reviewing his presentation on YouTube and looking through his slides, um, he has done a great deal to identify um, the executive function issues that are experienced by many people with ADHD. And Dr. Barkley often talks about how ADHD is often um, a difficulty with self-regulation and executive functioning. And that he defines self-regulation as any action a person directs toward oneself to change their subsequent behavior in order to change the likelihood of a future consequence. As we think about self-determination, <laughs> the ability to identify and achieve goals based on a foundation of knowing and valuing oneself, in many ways it looks like we're asking individuals who have ADHD to do exactly what may be most difficult for them. Um, self-determination at its heart has a large degree of self-regulation within it. It's regulating our own actions to be consistent with our goals and aspirations. So for an individual with ADHD, some of this may be particularly difficult. Um, Again, he talks about executive function as an action to the self, but then he also talks about major types of executive function. Self-awareness, well, that's a pretty big part of self-determination. Um, inhibition and interference control, when we talk about setting a goal, breaking it down into small steps, taking actions to reach that goal, there's a lot that one has to do to control interferences and inhibitions that might get in the way of reaching that goal. Um, certainly, we need working memory and nonverbal memory to keep in mind what we want to achieve and how we're going to get there. One of the things that we talked about um, with the students today, one of the issues that they brought up was being able to stay focused on their goals. That some of them said they, it wasn't so much an issue that they had in setting goals and knowing what they wanted, it was maintaining their focus on that goal. And we talked about some strategies to keep those goals forefront. Um, one was to make sure that it's a goal that truly is important to you and that has some salience for you. And then also to connect it to what's most important to you. Um, I provided them an example with um, a young woman that I was working with in a program for parents who were working toward their GED. 
and they're a high school equivalency. And the majority of the individuals in this group had dropped out of high school as they became parents, and they had young children, and they were now trying to get their, their equivalency degree. Well, a lot of the material that you have to master to get your GED is not exactly the most exciting, the most compelling. <laughs> and as we talked with them about, you know, all of them knew they wanted to get the GED, you know, that they were going to be limited if they didn't have that. And I remember talking with one young woman about why she wanted her GED. And she said, I need to get a job, I need to make money, and I said, why do you need a job? Why do you need money? And, you know, some basic things came out. And then I said, well, is there anything more that really excites you that you want to do? And she said, oh, I know exactly. I really want to take my kids to Disney World. My mom took me to Disney World. I took my kids to Disney World. It was hard for her, but I want to do it. And if I don't have this GED, I'm not going to do it. And so as she was working toward her goal of getting the GED, what she did is she kept very prominently pictures of Disney World, pictures of Dumbo, pictures of, you know, that her trying to keep in front of her the really emotional, salient reason she was doing all of this. What mattered to her in doing it. Um, then there are also other little strategies that people use of, and, and you've probably used many yourself, of, of keeping your goals on little post-its, of um, when you're using your smartphone, using it not only to set an appointment for, you know, or a, a, a little bell for an appointment time, but also setting it to remind you of what it is that you want to keep working on so that you get that reminder. Uh, one of the young men this morning was saying sometimes he would um, get engrossed in an activity and just completely forget that he was going to quit that activity and start studying. And so we talked about, you know, even if he doesn't have an appointment, setting the phone as his own reminder about the other goal that he had that he wanted to work on. Um, Self-regulating our emotions and, um, and planning and problem solving are all issues that many people with ADHD face and actually help to define um, attention deficit disorder. And so these are all things that are really critical for being able to have a sense of self-determination. And I think one of the reasons that the federal government um, through the U.S. Department of Education, put the research grants together, said that it's important for us to learn more about self-determination, it's important for us to learn more about how to support students to be more self-determined, was the recognition that for many individuals with disabilities, that, that their disabilities, while this is hard for all of us, and all of us are constantly working toward increasing our level of self-determination, if we have a disability, the disability may make it even harder. And not only are there the issues that are specific to the disability, like the difficulties with planning or problem solving, some of the difficulties with attention, but there is the double issue of potential stigma and dealing with other people's misunderstandings about a disability that we may have. And given the importance of the environment, then, so, so this process is important for all of us to thrive, survive, excel. It becomes even more challenging and potentially more important because of the, the possible misinformation that's out there um, for individuals who have disabilities. So let's move over to very concrete uh, how we help students and ourselves discover our interests, passions, strengths, weaknesses, set and work toward goals, 
reflect and learn from our experiences. We provided a few examples as we talked about the self-determination model of providing opportunities for lots of exploration, um, providing an opportunity to reflect on experiences, either through group settings or through one-on-one -on -one advising or coaching. I think many of our first-year experiences, that uh, first-year seminars that are common on many of our college campuses, if those are blended with an opportunity for the group to talk about what they're experiencing, um, to share that, to be heard, to be listened to, um, can really help to promote a sense of self-determination. Um, I'd like to go through four key areas that have been developed to help promote a sense of self-determination. And both including assessment, how we determine where we are related to knowledge and skills self-determination, some strategies that we consider cornerstone strategies that are important to be built into any effort we have to promote self-determination, some direct instructional techniques. I find it really interesting that we often expect people to pick up these skills. We expect students to pick up these skills related to becoming more self-aware, planning, um, anticipating results. We don't expect that of history. We don't expect it in writing or reading. We teach it. And yet, for many of our skills that help to promote self-determination, many of our study strategy skills, we somehow expect that those are just going to appear by osmosis and then we're surprised when they don't. So there are many instructional efforts, and I'll share with you some of the instructional kinds of programs that can help individuals develop the skills uh, to promote self-determination. And then also we'll spend a little bit more time talking about academic coaching. The process we use to conduct assessment is just as important as the assessment that we do. And too often, assessment is something that is done to individuals rather than something that is done with individuals. And one of the things that's really important when using assessment to promote self-determination is that we are including the student, um, if appropriate, his or her family, if appropriate, his or her um, consultants, friends in the process so that they're helping to determine the questions. They are um, in agreement with how the results will be used, what kind of information will be collected, and that they are a powerful part of the process. Um, I imagine all of you have had, there are many of you, maybe not all, or some of you are fortunate to not have had that, um, have had that experience of having some kind of a test at the doctor's and you're waiting for it to come back. But you also don't really know what it means. You don't know what you'll do if it's negative. Um, the more time that the physician spends with you so you understand what it is, what the implications are, and you're agreement, in agreement about whether or not it's even collected can make all the difference in your receptivity to it and how it's used. And so that's a really important caveat before we talk about any kind of assessment for self-determination. And then also, just as we need assessment in language arts, in math, um, in everything else, um, assessment for self-determination is important as well. That there's an active role that students and parents can play in that process. And one of the things that is it really important when it relates to self-determination is not just to be relying on a standardized test, but also to be using real-life examples. Because anything, self-determination is so real-life oriented that we need to keep our focus um, 
on how it's being implemented in real life. I had a wonderful experience. Well, it started out to not be a wonderful experience. It became a wonderful experience. With um, a student that I was working with on um, career planning. And she wanted to do some work in the computer industry that involved a great deal of fine motor skill. And within this preparation, she took um, a test that assessed her fine motor skill. It was horrible. I mean, she came out with, I mean, she was at the 20th or 30th percentile in her fine motor skill, and yet she really, really wanted to work in this area. Well, we talked about it, explored it, and she brought in her fine counted cross stitch to show me one day. It was really tiny, and I thought, wait a minute, that's got to take a lot of fine motor skill. And so we said, well, do you want to try it? Um, I'm happy to report that she spent an entire career at Tone Commander Computer Systems. Um, she did a lot of fine motor work before she um, was promoted to do some other things. And the test was wrong. <laughs> you know, I, a test is only one indicator. And it's really critical that we get several indicators if we're wanting to assess um, a certain knowledge or skill area. And that at least one of those indicators is behavioral, that we're observing the student. And it's really important that we not rely on only one piece of information. Um, we talked about the importance of always including behavioral assessment and of having a collaborative approach so that the student is at the center of it. As I've just said, that no one standardized instrument should be used by itself. I'll go ahead and share with you our standardized instrument. Um, we have a new instrument that's just been to, um, just been revised, actually. We developed a self-determination assessment battery where a student completes a self-determination student scale where they're responding to various situations, applications related to self-determination. Some that are very general, um, I'm a dreamer. Others that are more applied, when I'm with my friends, I speak up about what I'd like to do. Um, there are different response categories of either that's me or that's not me, or we also have one that looks at a five-point scale so they can get a little more nuanced. Um, there's also a teacher perception scale and a parent perception scale where the teacher and the parent are providing their input on what they've observed of the student on, around many traits related to self-determination. And any one of those instruments can be used alone or they can be used together. And while the instruments have been around for a long time in a paper and pencil version, um, just this last summer, we launched a, a web-based version of the instrument. So all three parties can go in and just complete the assessment instrument using their computer, and then they get back a, um, a form that shows how all the three scores compared. And the, and the purpose of that is to provide the basis for a discussion tool around the different um, knowledge, skills, and belief areas that the student has. The student scale also provides students with a um, score within each of the five components of the model of know yourself, value yourself, plan, act, experience, outcomes, and learn. So they get an indication of where their strengths are and where their areas for development may be. And notice I'm always saying an indication of where it may be um, because I feel so strongly that no one instrument, even ours, <laughs> no one instrument um, definitively 
gives an analysis of a student's skills related to self-determination, but instead it needs to be taken in conjunction with many other pieces of information. Um, that's available from Ely Education, and there's lots of information about it on the web if you're interested in that. Another website that I really like um, is the um, Signature Strength Survey from um, University of Pennsylvania. And um, Marty Seligman, who is um, considered by many to be the father of the positive psychology movement. Um, he was president of American Psychological Association at the time um, in the early 90s when there was a, a change in focus from looking not only at deficits that people may experience, but also looking at the positive realms of happiness, joy, uh, compassion, wisdom, and, and learning more about how people can reach higher states of positive mental health. And he has a few books that have been very popular in the popular press. Authentic Happiness is one of them. And on his website, he has a variety of instruments that you can take on the website. And they store your information. And so you can compare your scores over time. And one of my favorites, and particularly to use with students, is the Signature Strength Survey. And you respond to a variety of different questions, and then it gives you back some information about what may be some of your um, most important strengths, uh, such as curiosity, um, compassion, kindness. Um, and it's about 24 different characteristics that they rank order for you. And sometimes that can be pretty enlightening for students to look at. Um, I've been amazed at how many students are able to say all of those things that they don't feel good about about themselves, all of the things that they think are their challenges or their limitations, and often how little they're able to say about the things that they think are their strengths. And so that can provide an opportunity to begin that conversation. That if a student is having difficulty, like I mentioned the exercise that we've done before where a student identifies two strengths, a parent identifies two strengths, and then the student also identifies an area of challenge, that is enormously difficult for some students. And to do something like the little signature strength survey online can be something that, <coughs> excuse me, that jump starts that and helps them start thinking more about some of their strengths. Um, I shared with you already about our internet assessment. All right, our cornerstone strategies. Uh, we've been working with these over um, a long period of time. Um, some of these are actually specific strategies. They, they involve specific strategies we might implement. Others are more things that we do in the environment to create a climate and a and uh, that's harmonious with self-determination. Um, the first one, teachers are co-learners. Uh, and teachers and parents are co-learners. As we've talked about today, self-determination isn't just for students. You know, it's for all of us. And by becoming co-learners with our students, we both model self-determination and we create a very respectful collegial environment. When we have worked in high schools to um, help them implement our self-determination curriculum, we encourage the teachers to complete every lesson with the students. And to set their and a major part of that curriculum is setting goals, breaking the goal down into small steps throughout the period of time that they are working on their goal, working on the curriculum. Between each session, they're actually taking action toward their goal. That the teachers are putting themselves out there to say what they're going to do on their goal right along with the students. It has been so much fun. Um, there have been some really fun stories. 
we have an activity where students are encouraged to bring their parents to a class and our teachers brought their parents and she and one of the teachers said if I can drag my 85 year old mom out here <laughs> you can bring your mom too you know I'm, and um, and then um, another had a garden she'd moved into a house where she had a garden a perfect space for a garden that she wanted to plant and seven summers came and went no vegetable garden you know she just never got around to it something else was always more important the year that she set that as her goal with her students it got done because her whole class was watching it was back to accountability like Teresa has talked about before so it both creates a sense of fun but it also models self-determination for students. Um, my next slide actually talks a little bit about the importance of modeling. Um, this is my daughter Alana a long time ago. <laughs> She's now 20. Um, and my husband Alan, who's co-author of all of our work. And this literally, he was sitting there reading his book, as you can see, that kind of went by the wayside. And she just snuggled up there, did exactly the same thing, and brought her book. And whenever we wonder whether or not modeling really works, oftentimes all we have to do is think about that time we find ourselves doing what our parents did and we said we'd never do it. You know, I mean, it just happens. And so it's really one of the most powerful strategies that we can tap into. Um, along with modeling, cooperative learning. And I, I think that many of the groups that you have here at UNC have tapped into that extremely well. Um, having the, the study groups, um, the groups at the end of the semester, um, finding buddies, um, having not a top-down approach, but um, an approach where every individual within the group has a say. And much of this, I think, is important for preparing for the workplace as the next environment, because I think the workplace is beginning to change, in many ways has changed, to be much less top-down and to create much more expectation of involvement by employees. And I think that has to happen as we're moving from um, a much more information-based and skilled workplace that when we had simple tasks that needed to be completed, it was much easier to be directive and to be top-down. Now in the workplace, there are many, many more jobs where we need people to be problem-solving, to be creative, to be planning, and so we don't have that luxury of just directing anymore. So when we're doing that, when we're creating more cooperative learning groups, we're also helping students prepare for that next setting. Which brings me back to how well we are communicating across settings as we transition. And one of the things that I think is most challenging, as Teresa mentioned in the introductory remarks, is that the way in which support services are provided at the college level are so different from what's provided at the high school level. And at the K-12 level, um, teachers will seek out what students need. Um, there are annual individualized education plans required. Um, whereas in college, unless you go ask for the services, you're not going to get them. And there was one study that a friend of mine did where they <clears throat> Inter they interviewed people who had received services for students with learning disabilities in high school to see how they had taken advantage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Over half of the people that they interviewed said they didn't have disabilities. And they had received services for having learning disabilities while they were in high school. So there was, and given that to receive services under the ADA, You've got to first say, I have a disability and I need these services. You know, they simply weren't going to access them unless they sought them out. At the same time, 
I was speaking with um, a disability services coordinator at Pomona College last week in California, and she was talking about the kinds of accommodations and, and services that they provide for students who have disabilities, and her concern about many of those same services were not going to be available when they went out into employment. And so she was trying to figure out how do we provide accommodations and services, but at the same time help individuals learn how they're going to access services that they need or supports that they need or create themselves the supports that they need when they get to the workplace. And I think one of the biggest issues that we have today related to the transition of students uh, with disabilities from high school to college and then college to employment is I think that there's a lack of information and support for students and their families about what to expect when they take that next step. That they leave high school and go to college and expect that the same types of services often are going to be available. Or they leave college and go out to the workplace and still expect that those services are going to be available to them. And I think that that's a major issue that we all have to address in our roles that we play in our organizations as policymakers, administrators, teachers, students, parents, that having input about how information is provided to students and parents and how they can prepare for that. And the transition could be a lot, go a lot more smoothly if that were the case. Um, experiential learning is critical, um, that people have opportunities to try out what they're doing in real environments, that self-determination isn't hypothetical, it's not theoretical. Um, there may be a theory underneath it. However, it's about getting what we want. It's about working toward what we want. And so we need to be supporting students to work toward their goals in real situations. Coaching certainly does that. It's, it's an agenda driven by the student where the student is identifying what they need to do and then providing support as it goes along. To simply take a course on self-determination that doesn't have anything to do with practicing self-determination doesn't make any sense. And so if we're going to help students to increase their sense of self-determination, we clearly need to be providing them with the opportunities to practice it in real settings. Another piece is the use of inclusive or integrated grouping. Self-determination isn't something that's just for women, just for men, just for students with ADHD, just for, we all are working toward our self-determination. And we can, and it's one of the types of instruction that we have a lot to learn from people who are very different from ourselves. So putting people together into mixed groups as we're learning about self-determination I think is really powerful. And I believe in the Learning Center that's one of the things that I think is a real strength here at UNC is that they're providing services to students from a wide variety of areas including graduate students, undergraduates, different colleges, um, students who have a particular challenge with students who don't. And that's another important caveat. We've talked a lot about including students, families, and friends, and, and how if we make a change in the student to become more self-determined, but we don't provide support to parents, I think in colleges, providing supports to parents on how to back off a little, but how to still be there to be, you know, to... I, supports, I think that we can do our students in colleges a real service if we also provide some supports to parents about how they can better move through the transition of parenting a young adult as opposed to parenting a high school age student. Because it's not just a matter of hands off, but it is different. And again, ultimately every family needs to do that through a sense through trial and error. But the supports that we provide through our schools um, can help make that go a little more smoothly. Um, humor is kind of fun. 
when we were first developing our model for self-determination, um, we had um, advisory an advisory group of individuals with disabilities. We had other advisory groups as well. And um, as we were vetting the model with these groups, one of them said, and I will admit this was the academic group, one of them said, what's humor doing in there? Why do you have humor in this model about self-determination? Goal setting? Yeah, I get that. Planning? I'm there. Humor? Kind of lightweight. We went back to our group of people with disabilities, people who were very successful, who had had to um, address many barriers to their self-determination, and we said, we're getting this feedback that humor doesn't really fit. And they said, no, humor stays in. Humor is essential. They said it without a bit of humor. <laughs> and, and they said, humor both helps to lighten up the situation, you know, and deflect any issues, and then it also helps, you know, helps me to stay focused, they said, when, you know, when I get kind of down and, and not to take the whole thing too seriously. And there was one gentleman in the group who um, was quadriplegic. He was in a wheelchair with his hand strapped down to the side of the chair. He really only had control of movement above his neck. He had been CEO of a large company before he had an accident. And after the accident, he became CEO of a large agency that had a great deal of corporate support in the Seattle community. And so he had a very high-powered board. And after a number of meetings, um, one of these board members looked at Rich and he said, you know, Rich, I feel really uncomfortable when I first greet you. Every other colleague I have, I shake their hand and I kind of come to you and I don't know what to do. And Rich stopped and he looked a minute and he looked at him and he says, you know, Arnie, you can just kiss me. It's okay. <laughs> And this awkward moment was gone. Rich facilitated the, the conversation, built the relationship that helped to foster his self-determination. So helping students to appropriately use a sense of humor and kind of lighten up can make that whole self-determination process go a bit easier. And then finally, using those naturally occurring moments or teachable opportunities. So those are the cornerstones that with any instructional effort for self-determination, with any um, coaching that we're using, those are some caveats, I think, to keep in mind that will make any effort towards self-determination appropriate whether it is or more effective, whether it's something that we're working on for our own self-determination or whether we're trying to support the self-determination of others. In terms of instructional materials that are out there, um, University of North Carolina Charlotte had a um, grant from US Department of Education to review all of the self-determination curricula that were out there. Um, to do an analysis of the effectiveness of those curricula. And all, even though that project ended a number of years ago, they have maintained the website that includes information on all of those instructional packages. And I've included that website in your handout. And they also um, have on that same website a journal article in which they describe the um, effects of, the, um, of each of those curricula. Um, I'm happy to say that Steps to Self-Determination, which is the curriculum we wrote, um, was one of those and is included on that site. And, um, and uh, it was found to be effective pre to post in, in increasing self-determination knowledge and skills. But there are a number of others on there as well, including many free resources, including many resources that are for use in educational planning. I've seen people take many of the resources, um, including our curriculum, and adapt them in lots of different ways um, to meet their own 
uh, needs, especially one-to-one -one kind of coaching and tutoring. And again, one thing I think is important in self-determination instruction is to be self-determined in the way that you implement it. You know your students. You can read your students. You need to adjust as you go along and see how they're responding. And we really encourage people to take any kind of a curriculum package and make it their own to meet the needs of the students. Uh, we had an interesting experience when we were field testing our curriculum. We went into a school district. We did an initial training on it. And then we were coming back six weeks later to do um, some additional training to see how things were going to provide support and feedback. And I was the first person to arrive at this uh, meeting that was a follow-up. And one teacher walked in and she said, I feel terrible. I haven't done anything with this curriculum. I don't know if you've heard. I mean, things in our district, they've just been nuts. The superintendent was fired. New interim came in. The interim fired every administrator in the district and told them they could apply for their jobs back. My class lists are changing every day. I said, oh, doesn't sound good. Second teacher walks in. First teacher says to the second, she said, you haven't done anything with this curriculum, have you? Kind of like misery loves company, I hope you. And she says, oh, yeah, yeah, we've, we've done some things. And she said, well, what have you done? What session? Oh, we're on session nine. Nine? How did you get to nine? What did you do when they said, have a guest speaker come in? How did you have time to get a guest speaker? She said, oh, we didn't have time for that. I just had the kids go out and interview people. The first teacher was trying to do everything just the way we had laid out to do it. And it proved to be too difficult in her setting, and she ended up doing nothing. The second teacher assessed what was realistic in her setting and did what she could and adapted it. You know, and she did, she invited the guest speaker the next year. <laughs> you know, so she ended up trying out everything. But I think that that's really important no matter what kind of package you're picking up. As a teacher, as a parent, as a student, you have a lot of experience with this stuff. And so read through it and figure out what's going to make most sense for you. Um, another, there are also some wonderful materials out there that teach to different components of self-determination, even if they're not just self-determination. Uh, one that I found recently is the ruler approach uh, that was developed by Mark Brackett at Yale. And he is doing some wonderful work that's around social and emotional learning. And he has, much of his work has also been aimed at anti-bullying and giving students um, a greater awareness of what their own emotions are, how to regulate their own emotions, how to positively communicate their own emotions. Uh, he's worked primarily in K-12, although as I look at it, I see some really nice adaptations that could work in higher ed or in life. Everything that they've done in their program is based around this acronym of RULER, which is recognize emotion, understand the emotion. So, you know, first of all, what are you feeling? When you start to feel yourself either becoming angry or become bored or whatever emotion is beginning to take over you, recognize it, then work to understand it, label it, Express the emotion to someone and then regulate it. So you're managing it instead of it managing you. And he has several different activities within his curriculum. He's got a feeling words curriculum. He's got um, some other kinds of coaching activities. But I think just working with the acronym, when we look at the importance of emotional regulation to self-determination, and then we look at some of the difficulties going back to executive functioning that individuals with ADHD may have to deal with specifically, that learning some very specific strategies to deal with the emotions can really help to enhance self-determination. 
One of the reasons that I bring this up is to emphasize that not everything that we're going to do to promote self-determination is called self-determination. But if we look at that model and look at all of the things contained within it, we start to find lots of different resources. Which brings us to one of my favorites, <laughs> and one of my new favorites, of academic coaching. That I think academic coaching is um, what we've learned in our research and what I've observed uh, really uh, can be a very effective tool to promote self-determination. Um, academic coaching uses an inquiry approach with students um, or individuals. And, and actually, much of coaching developed first out of executive leadership. That um, persons in management, CEOs, were seeing that they needed a coach to help them run their businesses most effectively. So it was not a deficit-based approach. It's a strengths-based approach that helps an individual to function at maximum levels. And coaches are trained to ask clients questions, particularly powerful questions, um, to help individuals think through um, what they want to do, why they want to do it, how they're going to do it, what kinds of supports they need to do um, in, in order to be effective with that. And coaches essentially hold, hold their clients accountable. Um, and that can sound a little overbearing. However, accountable doesn't need to be that. Accountable is I'm checking back to see how things are going and then seeing if you want to revise that. It was interesting, before I even thought much about coaching and self-determination, um, I was having coffee with a friend who's a corporate attorney, corporate real estate attorney. And she deals a lot with a lot of pretty high-level conflict in her job. And she said, what is it you do again? <laughs> self-determination, uh, transition, you know, how do you spend your days? What is this? And I said, well, OK, let me. I tried a little bit to tell her. And then I said, well, let me give you an example. I said, what's something you've been wanting to do for a while? You really want to do it, but you haven't. She thought, she said, I want to get my kids pictures and albums. And I said, oh, well, you know, that's a pretty common one. And so as we chatted about it a little bit, we said, well, let's, you know, let's break that down into a few. What, what's like a baby step you could take this week? And finally she decided, well, I guess I need some albums. So I said, OK, well, OK, how about this week? You go out and you find some, you know, buy an album. Just one, just one. Just go buy an album. And let's have coffee next week. So the next week, we got together for coffee. Now, she may have been an overachiever. She had three albums filled. <laughs> this was something she had been wanting to do for herself for four or five years. But she had never carved out the time. And until she needed to be accountable for that goal in some way, um, she didn't do it. And so much of what is behind coaching is helping individuals discover what they most want for themselves, and then devising a way to do that, and then having someone who works with them to support them to do that. And I think that there are so many ways that coaching can be applied that are not just formal coaching. I think as instructors, we can use many coaching strategies. We faculty can ask far more what questions. What are you thinking about this? What would you like to do? Rather than telling or saying, 
why haven't you done this? Which immediately implies some type of criticism. Um, I think that we can break things into smaller steps for our students. I think that we can check back with students informally. Uh, same thing as parents. As parents, I think, I know one thing for me that's been hard to learn is to not talk with my daughter about everything I want at once. <laughs> you know, we haven't talked for a week. So, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done this? Have you done that? What's happening? You know, and the reality is to learn to hold back and for myself break it down into small steps and for everyone around me. My husband kind of appreciates it when I break things down into smaller steps too, <laughs> rather than just blasting him with everything that I want at once. So in many ways, when we are just looking at the big picture, we're only looking at the big goal that we want, it's very easy to become overwhelmed and to end up doing nothing. Um, or maybe surfing the web or something like that, some kind of distracting activity because we get ourselves so anxious, so overwhelmed at all that we need to do. But once that we find a way to break things down into small steps and take it step by step by step, which is a lot easier said than done, I think, because most of us are thinking toward the bigger picture. And sometimes we even forget that whole process of breaking down into small steps and how powerful it can be. Um, setting up a buddy that you're accountable to or who's accountable to you. Again, it doesn't have to be formal coaching. Uh, we had the opportunity to do some research on coaching at Wayne State University. Um, there is a foundation called the EDGE Foundation and their mission is to provide coaches for students with ADHD. It was founded by a gentleman who um, has ADHD himself, which he discovered after his daughter was diagnosed with ADHD. And um, she got coaching and then he got a coach. And he said, and she said, this is the most powerful thing we've ever done. We want to make this available to everyone. So a few years ago, they started the EDGE Foundation. Um, the purpose of it is to make coaching more widely available, primarily to students. It started out as students in higher education, and they're now working more with students in high school as well. And they asked, much of the, the research on coaching um, has been anecdotal. Uh, there has not been a lot of research on it. They wanted a, a research study that looked, um, that had an experimental design, so it had a treatment group and a control group. Um, they wanted quantitative data as well as um, qualitative, so we were looking at numerical data as well as interviewing students. And uh, we were in 10 different universities across the country. Um, one reason we couldn't be at UNC Chapel Hill and we were disappointed was because you already had so much good coaching here. And we needed to work with students who hadn't had the opportunity to be coached. Um, they were coached over a period of nine months. They had half hour telephone coaching sessions once a week plus follow up sessions. And the follow up sessions were as deemed appropriate by the student and the coach. So the follow-up sessions sometimes were just email reminders, sometimes they were actual phone calls, sometimes they were Skype, but the coach would, like, they might set a goal in a session that a student would say, I want to have um, an outline for this paper done by next Tuesday, and then the coach would email the student to say, how's the outline? So the student knew that there would be some accountability. Well, what we found was pretty stunning. <laughs> um, it exceeded anything we thought we would find. Um, on the learning and study strategies inventory, there are three different clusters of items. One is study skills. One is will, which is primarily motivation. And another one is self-regulation. And 
the um, light gray is the group that was coached. The dark gray is the control group. So on skill, you'll see that the um, treatment group went from 76 to 133 over the year, while the control group went from 101 to 122. So the control group went up without any coaching. You know, there's some maturation that helped them to improve in these areas um, just naturally. However, the amount that the um, coached group went up was so much more dramatic. And to me, the one that I was most excited about, particularly as we're talking about students with ADHD and issues in self-regulation and executive functioning skills, was self-regulation where they almost doubled throughout the school year with coaching and where there was a much less dramatic increase for the group, for the, um, the control group. We also did interviews with the students. I loved the interviews. The interviews um, said so much more to me about what it really meant for individuals to be coached. Um, students were telling me, you've got to make sure this is available to all students. Um, does it really have to end? How, how is it that I can't participate anymore? You know, because we only had the funding for the one year. Um, one, per, one young man showed me a smartphone and he said, this is my link to my coach. <laughs> You know, this, this is what I need to know that someone's with me when it gets tough. Um, what the relation, and it affirmed how important the relationships are. You know, that having someone to ask questions, to bounce ideas off of, to, um, many of them talked about um, how it decreased their stress levels. Uh, we did not see um, a statistically significant gain in grade point average. But a lot of that is because that's not what a lot of the students wanted to work on. Yes, they wanted to do better in school, but what was immediate for them was being completely stressed out. You know, and they needed to get a handle on their lives as a whole, not just on their academics. So I think that you here at UNC Chapel Hill are really in the forefront of coaching. And, um, and I think that you're really on the right track when it comes to promoting self-determination using many of those strategies. And I think that there are many things that can be done with coaching that go beyond just the one-to-one -one coaching relationship. I know you've had some coaching groups here that have focused on students at the doctoral level for their dissertations. Wow, I think we'd have a lot fewer ABDs if we had more coaching groups for doc students. So a few strategies just as reminders about the kind of ways that we can help to improve our self-determination. Giving ourselves opportunities to explore, of not having to be certain about everything that we do before we attempt it, but giving ourselves the permission to try out new and different things so that we um, are able to find what we really like, don't like, test our skills, test our limits. Um, reflecting on our experiences so that we take that time not just to have the experience but to reflect and preferably with a close friend, counselor, advisor about what that experience meant to you. Um, mindfulness. Um, there's been a lot of work in the last few years on, on mindfulness in education. <coughs> And there is a wonderful group out of Wellesley that is that's the Association for the Contemplative Mind in Higher Education. And it's looking at how mindfulness practices can be integrated in, in um, higher education. John Kabat-Zinn, who's with the UMass Medical School, has done some really innovative work on the scientific basis for how meditation can help to slow our brains down help us to focus, help us to um, increase our attention span. And um, I know many student groups around the country. At my daughter's college, there's a student group um, that just has 
a focus on mindfulness meditation and they provide that for their students. And again, I'd encourage you to think broadly as you think about resources to support self-determination that it doesn't have to all be provided out of the student services office. But student, student activity groups, um, special weekend workshops, um, activities that happen within the academic program can all help to promote self-determination. Um, starting small, keeping those baby steps, that also helps to keep the risk down so it doesn't you know, quite pump up that blood pressure and make it a far too scary thing to take that first step. Using support. Um, and remembering that all experiences have that opportunity to be the learning experience, that nothing is wasted. Um, as, we, as I looked through what I had to share today, I guess I wanted to have a few thoughts about kind of some of the generalities of things that we can do today. And I know many people who will pick up just one of these and say, okay, today I'm going to try one new thing that I've never done before. Or today I'm going to um, notice three things that I really like. I mean, there are many concrete things that we can do. Okay, before we get to questions, I want to just walk you through a few of the resources. And, and this is larger than what was on the initial um, PowerPoint. Um, the first book is a very academic book. For those of you in academia here who are focused on post-secondary education supports, it's a great resource. Um, most of these, I'm only going to pick out a few because most of these will be self-explanatory. Um, Madeline Levine, her work is a gem. If you have a chance to take a look at it, it's kind of how we got to this point of, of being so competitive and having so much pressure on our kids to meet goals that are not of their own making <laughs> and the price that we're paying for that. And... Um, and some of her work is absolutely priceless. And one of her favorite quotes that, that I love is where she talks about we, we have created an environment where students feel such a demand to be perfect that we have actually destroyed any real chance for them to achieve the kind of true perfection that they could achieve because they're so busy often just trying to meet the demands of the test, the demands others place on them. Um, our self-determination strategies for adolescence and transition provides case studies, so it provides um, some real um, real life pictures of what self-determination looks like. I already mentioned Daniel Pink. It's very readable. New York Times bestseller list for a long time, primarily focused on um, business, but does a really nice, very digestible. Uh, look at self-determination a lot. He never uses the words, well, he does use the word self-determination a few times when he talks about self-determination theory, but it's um, a very easy read and has lots of practical strategies. Um, you'll notice some familiar names up here. Patty Quinn, who has been here before for the Burnett Lecture, and Teresa Maitland, who has um, written a lovely, very user-friendly guide for students on preparing for um, college. I know lots of people have very different reactions to Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In. Um, I did too. <laughs> but I do think that she has some very interesting um, points to ponder, and I felt that I learned a lot about my own thoughts about self-determination as I considered what she had to write. And one of my favorite things that stuck with me from what I read is her question of, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Which is a very interesting question to ponder, and I think something that's worthy of pondering when we think about self-determination. Um, Jody Sleeper Triplett has done a fabulous job of compiling information about coaching adolescents with ADHD. And it's, a, again, a very practical, user-friendly book, and it um, gives a lot of coaching-inspired strategies that are appropriate for faculty and parents, as well as for coaches. Um, I mentioned some of the instructional materials earlier. 
And then finally, a few websites. And um, the two that up there that are ours are both in development. Are all, all, are all websites always in the process of development? <laughs> Seems like everyone's always redoing them. Um, the uh, university website compiles most of the research. We're just starting a new website um, called 2BSD, 2B Self-Determined. And it's, uh, we're not quite sure what it's going to be yet. It actually was inspired by preparing for this talk. Um, I wanted to pull everything together uh, in one place so that if people wanted to look for information on Mark Brackett's ruler approach, that there'd be a link to it on this website. If people were interested in learning more about coaching, they'd be able to find Jody's book. And so that's what it's going to start out as. It's still in development, should be launched January or February. Um, but I'd welcome your ideas and thoughts about what you think it should be, if you want to drop me an email, too, about what you think would be useful. So that's the end of my prepared remarks, and I think it's now time for Q&A.